Praise God. Saints, turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And as you do so, let's commit our time to the Lord, time of the exposition of His Word. Father, we bless You and we worship You that through Jesus Christ the church is being built. We thank You, my God, that You have foretold that Your Son will come back for a glorious bride without spot, without wrinkle, holy and blameless and without reproach before You. And Father, as always, our hearts cry that we will be found in that number. O Lord God, that You would keep us by the power of Your Spirit through the correction and the instruction and the edification of Your Word. And Lord, as I come to teach, I ask that you give me a grace to teach with accuracy your word and speak only that which you have me speak. But Lord, give us a, a grace to hear what you are saying to your church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you turn, or well, as you should have arrived by now, into 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, just a disclaimer is that although we have, I don't know how many people are here today, but uh, this is not the congregation. Uh, there are thousands of people who watch the teachings that, uh, that uh, come from our website. So what I'm going to share today might not necessarily be for you individually. Can you say that? This might not be for me. This might be for the folk that's, that watch the, the teachings, and it is predominantly for the folk who watch the teachings. The title of the message is Judgment Begins at the House of God. Wonderful way to start a Sunday morning. Judgment Begins at the House of God. But I want us to frame that statement that we know from Peter. It is found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. But to understand why Peter makes that statement, we must understand the background. What was the context? Which in which Peter then brings this warning out, and we take up from verse 7. And I do believe that there should be a presentation, or just something to follow. There you go. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. The end of all things is at hand. Now in Peter's time, Peter was absolutely convinced, as was Paul and the rest of the apostles, that Jesus would return in their lifetime. They were absolutely assured of that. And so they admonish the church, be watchful, be serious in your prayers. Judgment is come or has come to the household of God. It is increasing. The great falling away began in the third century with the beginning of the Roman church. It increased with the falling away of many in the charismatic word of faith church. It has come to the denominational churches, many in the Methodist, Presbyterian, uh, Church of England, Church of Scotland, Episcopalian. Many have come, gone into gross error and fallen away to a liberal theology, ordaining homosexual priests, not standing out against sin. The falling away began in the third century, and God is continually sifting His church now God's focus is on the so-called remnant. Those who have come out of all these different uh, denominations that have gone astray, God is now focusing His attention on that group. Let me assure you, saints, He is. As I said uh, when I was in the States, I said, mark my words, you are going to see a great division in the remnant church. What is our response as we, near, we come closer and closer to, to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? What is our reasonable response? 
Make sure that our investments are best positioned for a good return. Make sure that all our alterations that we want to do to our house are sorted out. No, saints, the closer we come to the Lord's return, the more serious we must take our faith, the more serious we must take our prayer the more watchful and alert we must be. We mustn't become less zealous. We must not become less serious, but all the more. As we move closer and closer and closer, as you see events unfolding in the world that are fulfillments of Bible prophecy, we are to draw closer to Jesus. What's happening in the remnant church is they're drawing closer to their television screen. It used to be that the news would come on once, once a day on television. Now it's 24-7 and you have believers pinned to the TV 24 hours a day waiting for something to happen and becoming cold of heart, falling away, becoming backslidden and not even knowing it. I was in a conference where a whole lot of people had come travel for miles around the United States. Some of them did not attend one session. They sat in the foyer because they are so spiritual they have no need of fellowship and the worship of God. A level of arrogance I have not seen in the Word of Faith Church. And they pat themselves in the back because we don't follow Rome. We know that homosexuality is wrong. And they puff themselves up and they pack themselves in the back because they can see the sign of the times unfolding, but they have no relationship with Jesus. Do you think such will stand? The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, we are to be serious and watchful, Peter says. Verse 8, And above all things... Have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. So as we draw closer and closer to the Lord's return, not only is our relationship with the Lord to become more fervent and more passionate, but our care for one another must increase. Why? Because the Spirit warned that in the end times, people will become self-absorbed and selfish. Paul warns Timothy. He says the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, men will be full of pride and puffed up and self-seeking and boastful, etc., etc., etc. And because of the Spirit of the age, coming in not only to the world but coming to the church, we need to be watchful and all the more not allow selfishness and self-centeredness to hinder our relationships with one another. As the day of the Lord draws near, so we are to be more fervent in our relationship with the Lord and more passionate and caring with our love for one another. Praise the Lord. First... Uh, sorry, First Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. If you, it's still early. It's quarter past 10. Praise God. I will watch. If anyone starts yawning, I'll close. But Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Paul writes to the church and he says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Pause. Paul is going to talk about our conduct, our behavior that is worthy of the gospel. Our conduct that is worthy of being called Christians. What should our conduct be? He says, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, one mind, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, a unity, a desire to stand in unity. Verse 28, and not in any way terrified by adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation 
and that from God. Love one another. Seek to be united. Don't be terrified of persecution. It's coming. It's increasing. Verse 29, an incredible, incredibly encouraging verse. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. For to you it has been granted, you have been privileged by the Lord, not only to believe in Him. It is a great privilege to know the Lord. It is a great blessing to know the Lord but also to suffer for His sake. With the, with the full knowledge of Jesus comes suffering. When we give ourselves fully to Him, you are going to suffer persecution. This is the reality of those who love the Lord. To avoid persecution, all you need to do is wax cold in your heart towards Jesus. In this world, you will have Tribulation, Jesus says. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Chapter 2 says, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, you've just been told that you're going to suffer persecution. It's been granted to you on behalf of Christ that not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. And then, verse 1 of chapter 2, Paul says, Therefore, if there's any consolation, well, great, Lord, I've got to suffer for you. Is there anything that can encourage me? Let's face it, who wants to suffer? No, we don't want to suffer. We want to preserve our lives. But because persecution is a given for the believer, Paul by the Spirit says, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Let's back up. The consolation that you and I have is the fellowship with the Spirit. That is our consolation and intimacy with God. Christianity is not a theology. It is not an academic pursuit. Christianity is a love relationship with a God who cares for us deeply and who desires intimacy with us. And in drawing close to the Lord, you are marked by the enemy. And you will suffer as the Lord allows. Persecution. But this is the consolation. This is the edification. This is the encouragement. Is the fellowship of the Spirit. God wants us to know Him intimately. And it's that intimacy with the Lord is that personal relationship that strengthens you and allows you to stand against persecution, saints. So if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, you're going to crumble under persecution. This is the edification. So, let our conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. If we're going to be Christians, let's be Christians. If you're going to suffer for the sake of Jesus, let's do it properly. Let's love Him with all our heart. Let's draw near to Him. Let's be serious. Let's love one another fervently. Let's care for each other. Let's seek to be in unity with true brethren. Let's pursue these things, saints. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. So when your spouse says to you, I've invited some brethren round for tea, don't grumble. <laughs> what should we eat? What should we serve them? Your heavenly father knows you have need of such things and therefore you go to pick and pay. Love one another. You know, again, this might be a long service. I'm going to share some, just some uh, stories. We were sitting, having a fellowship lunch at one of the churches in the States, and uh, folk at the table asked me, what, what, what is my 
sort of opinion of, of, of American Americans. And I asked them my usual, I responded with my usual question. Do you really want to know? <laughs> and so they said, yes. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, you guys are awfully polite one to another. I said, that's quite amazing. You really are polite and, 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 and show respect to each other. I said, but it's just skin deep. I said, there's no substance to your relationships. I said, you never open your homes to one another. You never, I said, in all my time I've been to America, I've probably been to two people's homes. And I said, you, you just don't open your lives up to each other. I said, the Bible says we ought to be hospitable. To love, to care, to encourage one another. Saints, as the day of the Lord draws near, not only are we to be fervent in our relationship with the Lord, but we are to love one another practically. Practically. Not to pat somebody in the back and say, I love you, brother, and you don't see them for a week. Not to say, I'm praying for you because I know you're going through troubles and not trying to do something to help alleviate. This is what it is to be part of a body. It's to care one for another. We are to be hospitable. Not be a hospital, that is well. We are to be both. But to open up our homes and our lives to one another. You might not cook well. That's okay. I'll give you some recipes. <laughs> the point is to share your life, to exhort, to encourage one another without grumbling. Verse 10. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As each one has received a gift. Now, for those of you who have been in the church for any length of time, you have probably heard it said dozens of times from this pulpit that each one of you has a gift from God. Is that correct? How many have heard that before? Stick your hand up in the air and get charismatic on me. Praise the Lord. I see those hands. Now, you've heard that. It is a truth. Because the Bible says... In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that God has given to each one a gift. That you are His workmanship, creating Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has prepared before for you to walk in. Right? You are His workmanship. He has given you a gift. It's not to necessarily preach behind a pulpit. It's not to go pack up and go into deepest, darkest Africa to become a, a missionary. But each of us has something of the Spirit of God, something to give another. And here, Peter, by the Spirit of God, exhorts the believers that as you see the day of the Lord approaching, we need to be more serious, in, not only in the area of prayer and being watchful, not only in the area of loving one another, but also in being responsible to minister that which God has given us for the benefit of the body of Christ. You know, saints, I don't, call, I don't profess to be a prophet. I really don't. But let me tell you, I've seen so many things come to pass where the Lord's given me a, just, a, just a clear insight into His heart come to pass. And I'm telling you, the end time church is going to land up in homes. Firstly, because of persecution. But secondly, it's the only arena where you can truly exercise your gifts. That's why in this church, and I'm, I'm so pleased Kevin is keeping up with the emphasis, house church is the backbone of this church. This is where you're able to exercise your gifts. And not just on a Wednesday night, but throughout the week. Exercise your gifts. Be the priest that God has ordained you to be. Find out what your calling is. Well, how do I do that, David? Well, it's really complicated. It's unbelievably complicated to know what your gifting is. You ready? Pay attention. For those of you who have heard it, you'll hear it again. For those of you who have never heard it, pay attention. It's very complicated. Got your attention. Your gifting 
is that area, when you look at the church, both externally, that is evangelism, missions, or internally, pastoral, caring for one another, discipling one another, it's that thing that grips your heart. You're sitting in church and saying, why aren't we sending people out? Who phones the elderly? Who's in charge of the cupcake roster? Why aren't, don't we have more home churches? Have you ever, you know those things that bug you? They terrify you because you know you can't do them. Do you get that? They bug you, but they terrify you because you know you can't do them. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Anyone? Great, that's your gifting. It's not something that you're naturally able to do. Otherwise, you don't need God's grace. You don't need to trust Him. Your gifting is that which God stirs in your heart, but you're not going to do it because it overwhelms you. So you're the kind of people that come to the pastor and say, we need to start this ministry, pastor, so when are you going to start a pastor? And the pastor then does something terrible, unsettling. He says, God gave you the burden, you start it. That's how to know your gifting. All right, this is the context in which Peter is addressing the church. And he says in the 11th verse, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 12. Beloved. Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is which is to try you. How many of you have been or are going through some very difficult times? Do not think it strange. Despite what the word of faith people say, that Christ died to make you healthy, wealthy, happy and wise, it is a lie of the devil. Christ came to give you eternal life. Christ came to give you adoption and inheritance. That is the gift of God, more precious than anything this life can ever offer. But the Lord needs to deal with our characters. He needs to deal with us as individuals. He needs to grow us in our faith. And the best tool that the Lord has is trials, tribulations, and testing. Hence, James says, Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials. Nobody enjoys hardship. But, as Peter says to the beloved, he doesn't doesn't say, dear backslider. He says, beloved. He's talking to fellow believers who are in love with Jesus, who are part of the body. And he says to them, beloved, do not think it strange. It is not a strange thing. It is not an unusual thing for you to be faced with trials and testings. It is not unusual. It is normal. In the Christian walk, there are times of testings and times of great blessing. And you go from one to the other and sometimes in between. It's not about stuff. Jesus Christ didn't die to give you stuff. That was Father Christmas and He didn't die. He didn't pay any price. He just ate all the cookies and that's why He's fat and He can't squeeze down the chimney. Jesus died. He paid a price so that He can give you eternal life. And to enter into eternal life requires the death of ourselves. As Christ died to give us eternal life, we need to die to self to inherit it. Agreed. It's not easy believerism. Just confess Christ as Lord and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Right? That's the Wizard of Oz theology. Click your heels three times and you're back in Kansas. It doesn't work that way. But rejoice, verse 13, to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached in the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, on the unbelievers' part, He is blasphemed, 
But on your part, He, Jesus Christ, is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Notice how Peter ranks it. Don't suffer as a murderer. That's bad. But so is a busybody. Just as bad. Let your conduct be worthy of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 16, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Verse 17, Four. Four is a conjunction. In light of all that has been said, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? What is Peter saying? Why does he spring verse 17 on us? In the light of the exhortation to be watchful and serious as the day of the Lord approaches, in light of the exhortation for us to love the Lord with all our heart, to, be, to love one another and to be hospitable to be one another, to have our conduct worthy of the calling, why does he say, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God? Well, what he's saying is the church needs to reflect Christ. The church needs to be cleaned up. God can't judge the unsaved until He judges the saved. He can't judge. God couldn't judge the nations around Israel until He judged Israel. God is a righteous judge. He has to apply the same measure outside the church as well as inside the church. Otherwise, He'd be unjust. He'd have two different scales. God hates unjust balances. He hates unjust scales. God detests partiality. Therefore, God Himself cannot be partial. So if God is going to bring a great judgment upon the unsaved because of their rebellion and the ref their refusal to obey Him and to bow their knee to His Lordship, He has to apply the same measure to His... Oops, that was soft. There was far less enthusiasm on that one. God is just, saints. He has only one standard, His standard. And He applies that standard both to the unsaved and the saved. What is the standard? Our response to Jesus. That is the standard. If the unsaved do not bow their knee to His Lordship, are they any different to those who profess Christ as Lord who do not obey, Lord, uh, don't obey Christ? Let me repeat that again because I've got tongue twisted somewhere in the middle. If the unsaved do not bow their knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, will they be judged any more harshly to those who profess to be Christians who do not obey Jesus? The standard is the same. For this is the condemnation, Jesus says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, that light came into the world and men loved darkness rather than come to the light. This is the condemnation. This is the standard by which God judges all men, saved, unsaved. Well, let me re rephrase that. In the church or out of the church? It's the same standard. What is your response to the light of Christ? Do you make Him Lord? Well, the unsaved say, no, we want nothing to do with Christ or Christianity. But then you have those who say, I identify with the gospel. It makes sense. I don't want to go to hell. So what is the minimum requirement to get to heaven? Well, the minimum requirement is to die. Is to give every facet of your being to Him. That's the minimum requirement. You can't meet that, you're not going to make it. It sounds hard, doesn't it? Well, the fact is, none of us will attain to that standard. But we can desire to. Are you hearing me? We, not, we will never attain to the standard of perfection. We never will. But... God wants us to desire, to pursue holiness, to seek it. We won't attain it, the side of heaven. We will not. Are you hearing me? You will not. I will not. The great apostle Paul could not. Because we are imperfect, we still have the sin nature. 
But God wants us to pursue, to chase after. That's all we can do. And if that is your desire, then you're, a, you're in a good place. You're safe with the Lord. There is no fear. There is no condemnation. There's no need to worry. You see, it's a heartitude. Are you, are you hearing me? It's not legalism. It's not works. God desires that we love Him. He desires that we pursue Him. He knows that we'll not be perfect, but He wants us to desire. And when you desire, guess what? You become more and more Christ-like. You don't attain the side of eternity, but you begin to reflect more and more of Jesus. So judgment must begin at the house of God. God must sift His church. Because He's going to apply the same standard to the world. So scarcely saved doesn't mean that the Father makes it hard for us to be born again. It's not that He makes it hard. It's the fact that we are fallen creations. And until we resolve to not be slaves to our sin nature, until we resolve that I want to serve the Lord with all my heart, soul, and might, until we resolve that, it's difficult. It's difficult being on the fence. Let me say it's impossible to be on the fence. The righteous are scarcely saved because the only way to be saved is to surrender your life fully to Jesus. That's the only way to be saved. To cry as the psalmist cried, Lord, search me and see if there be any wicked thing in me. Is to, as Paul said in Romans 12, is to present yourself a holy sacrifice. Right? A living sacrifice. Sorry, to present yourself a living sacrifice. Is to bring yourself before the Lord perpetually, saying, Lord, take my life. Just take everything out of me that's displeasing to you. It's that hunger. To be his child. And that brings such joy and it brings such liberty and it's such a freedom. Truly loving God is the most amazing thing. Because there is no guilt, there is no condemnation, there's just a joy, 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 unspeakable and full of glory. And to weep in repentance and to ask God to forgive you and to ask God to conform you to his image is a joy. And then you hate the world and the things in the world and you don't want to be like the world. And God's grace is with you and He enables you to live in holiness. It's wonderful, saints. It's not religion. Praise God. And as I conclude, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I don't want to go on too long. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren... Rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Are you getting tired of hearing the same messages over and over again? Good. It's safe. As P Peter says the same thing in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. He says, I'm gonna, as long as I'm with you, I'm going to keep on reminding you. I'm going to remind you of these things. I'm going to keep telling you these things because you don't need new revelation. You just need to do the basics. I long to, to see Christians just doing the basics. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And for me to write the, the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Paul goes on to speak about the Hebrew Roots Movement and the Judaizers. And he speaks of his, his own life prior to being a believer. He says, if anyone, in verse uh, 4, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may be confident, he have confidence in the flesh, I am also circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel or the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul was quite a man. Paul was quite a guy. Righteous according to the law of Moses. Verse 7, but. 
who you were before you came to Jesus is irrelevant. There are too many Christians glorying in who they were. I travel and I see, I, I've got to sit with Christians and they're talking about all sorts of things. I'm not going to say too much, lest I incriminate people. But I get dragged to places that I want to go. That's why I now hire cars. It's very expensive, but it keeps my spirit and soul at peace. But they think it's a joy to show me things, things of this world. And I've told people, I don't want to see them. I'm not interested in who died here and who played here. And I'm not interested. I have no desire to know. Yes, but we used to. And it's like they're pining for the past. It's almost though like that they are mournful that they're Christians. That they've had to give up that glorious life when they were somebody's. That to be a slave to Jesus Christ without reputation is something to be despised. But Paul says in verse 7, What things were gained to me? Who I was as a Pharisee of the Pharisees? My reputation, my power, my wealth, my station. What things were gained to me? What used to define me? What used to be important to me? These I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge. The Greek word there, knowledge, is knowledge. Of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, dung, excrement. I look at my life in Christ and the glory and the joy of this new life that when I look at my past and all that the world esteems, to me it's dog doo-doo. It's poop. Yet we have Christians who yearn for the old who talk about the old because it's the old that defines them because they are not new creations in Christ they do not reflect Jesus they have no desire for the upward call of God they desire the past they are like Lot's wife twice dead having obtained salvation and despising it for the old judgment is coming to the remnant the rest of the church world has been judged how ought we to be the end of verse 8 I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him. Now, that's a Greek word you want to know. Gionosko. Remember Gionosko? It is to have an intimate knowledge of that which is known, to be in relationship with that which you know. And it speaks particularly in our relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. I do not know about Him. I know Him with intimacy. Verse 10, that I may know Him, that I may be intimate with Him, and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul lays it out. Not one saved, always saved. I need to desire Him. I need to pursue Him. I need to want Him to be my Lord. I mustn't yearn for the, the old, but pursue the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's not difficult, saints. It's a hard attitude. Do you want to be the man or the woman you used to be? Do you want to have the fame, the fortune, the notoriety you had in the past? Do you want to be that person? Then put it behind you. Cut it off from you. Lay yourself on the altar and pursue Jesus. This is the call of God. And then Paul says, an encouragement to us all, 
In verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. I know I'm going to fall. In all my desire and in all your desire to follow God and to be upright before Him, you're going to fall. Because you're imperfect. But I press on. I pick myself up, repent of my sin, press on. And God's with you by, your, by His Spirit, encouraging and exhorting you. You're not going to be perfect, but that doesn't mean you don't continue to press on. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Christ has laid hold of you for eternal life. Well, grab that eternal life. Grab Jesus. As He's grabbed you, hold on to Him. Let His hand be on your wrist and your hand upon His. Don't let Him be dangling because you just want to say, let go. As He holds you, hold Him. It's all the Lord's asking. It's easy. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. The failures, my past life, the times I've disappointed God, all my shortcomings, I put them behind me. I forget about them. They are covered in the blood. And reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That is all that God requires a heart that desires him yes judgment is coming final judgment will come and the righteous are scarcely saved because we have to fight against us in nature but when a man or woman determines in their heart to follow christ and says lord give me the strength in my own self i have no ability God's not looking for strong people. He's looking for people who will just trust Him. Okay? It's a hard attitude. If that is our heart's desire, the words of Jesus, He who believes in me has passed from judgment into life. And that we believe doesn't mean just to acknowledge Him, but to truly yield yourself to His Lordship. He who truly believes, has passed from judgment into eternal life. And that is the edification. Let us desire Him, saints. Praise God.